Ocrevus is the most commonly prescribed disease-modifying therapy for multiple sclerosis in the United States, but is it safe to take during the COVID-19 pandemic? The man to the right is Professor Gavin Giovannoni, who posted a very interesting opinion article that I'd like to comment on. For those who don't know Professor Giovannoni, he's very prominent within multiple sclerosis research, and he has a very well-known multiple sclerosis blog about MS research, which I'll go ahead and post in the links below. And he's very well respected, he's extremely knowledgeable. And he posts this quote in an opinion article that he recently published. The existing and emerging data indicate that anti-CD20 therapies are likely to be safe to initiate and redose during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, one of the things that inspired this comment is this article published on a case report of someone who is 58 years old with primary progressive MS on Ocrevus who had a good outcome. So he was sort of moderately disabled, EDSS of six. He was, in other words, he required a cane to walk 100 meters. If you want a little bit more about this disability scale EDSS, I'll post up a card above. And he was last treated in August 2019, and this event was in early March 2020, and they say that his planned infusion in, in February was delayed for unrelated reasons. And he actually had low immunoglobin G, which is known to be correlated with infections, and he also had low CD19 positive cells. CD19 is a marker of B lymphocytes, so the CD19 cell count was only 8. Normal would be around 150 to 200, for instance, and that's a normal effect of this medication, even 6-7 months after the treatment. And he had a very mild illness with fever and cough, no pneumonia, the chest x-ray was normal, and he was discharged home in two days, and they followed up 14 days later, and he had absolutely no symptoms. And now, of course, his article, G uh, Professor Giovannoni, was not solely based on this, but also some other uh, arguments. For instance, it's known that B cells are not as important as other cells of the immune system in fighting viral infections. We know that CD8 positive or cytotoxic T cells are actually more important, along with natural killer cells. And medications such as Ocrevus and Rituxan and Ofatumumab, all the anti-CD20 agents for multiple sclerosis, have no effect on these cells. They only deplete B lymphocytes. Also, most of the infections in clinical trials on rituxan and ocrevus are bacterial infections like pneumonia, urinary tract infections, and cellulitis. Now, there are definitely some viral infections that have been associated with ocrevus. Some examples include shingles, which is a painful rash, a reactivation of varicella virus. Also, reactivation of hepatitis B and C are known to be associated with this drug. There was a single case of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy associated with Ocrevus, and I'll go ahead and put up a card about that case report. That is the rare viral infection caused by the JC virus that's most associated with the MS drug Tysabri. And there was also a single case report of hepatitis due to Echovirus 25 in someone taking Ocrevus. And this is a rare opportunistic infection that should not occur normally in an immunocompetent person. So it's very likely related to the Ocrevus. But this is all still very rare. These viral infections are quite uncommon. Furthermore, there's this interesting data from the United Kingdom's Intensive Care National Audit and Research Center, which shows that if you look at viral pneumonias in general, between 2017 and 2019, so this is the bottom of the graph, you can see that about 8.5% of those people who were admitted to the hospital with viral pneumonias were immunocompromised. Whereas if you look at severe COVID-19 in 2020, only 2.3% were immunocompromised. And it's not like people are taking less immunosuppressive drugs. I mean, we're still treating cancer. We're still treating autoimmune diseases with these drugs. They're not becoming less popular. So why are people with severe COVID-19 seemingly underrepresented compared to viral pneumonia in general? Well, there may be some explanation for this. Because part of COVID-19, part of the reason that makes it so bad, seems to be sort of an overreaction of the immune system. And I'll put up a card of some general, uh, general information about how the immune system reacts to COVID-19. And it turns out that people can get this sort of cytokine storm where they have elevated levels of various cytokines, with their, which are proteins involved in immune cell signaling, and they can get this sort of overwhelming inflammation in the lungs, which interferes with gas exchange, and it can cause a syndrome known as acute respiratory distress syndrome. And this can actually be treated with immunosuppressants. 
Some examples include steroids, prednisone, and methylprednisolone. Fingolimod, which is Gelenia, which is actually a multiple sclerosis drug, is being studied in acute respiratory distress syndrome for COVID-19. Tocilizumab, which is an anti-interleukin-6 agent. And uh, the reason for this is because interleukin-6 is one of the cytokines that's elevated during the cytokine storm and actually sort of predicts in advance who is most likely to end up on a mechanical ventilator and also anakinra, which is an anti-interleukin-1 agent. So it's almost like being immunosuppressed could even be a slight advantage, not in terms of preventing the infection, but maybe in preventing this sort of overwhelming inflammation, which actually may be worse than the infection itself in some cases. And people have reported that they're often doing swabs and PCR tests on the saliva and the nasopharynx, and they're coming back negative, but people still have this acute respiratory distress syndrome. So people are dying of COVID-19 even after the virus is completely gone and undetectable. Now, what about data that's been published about MS and COVID-19? Well, this is, excuse me, I should say unpublished because none of this data is actually published yet. This is Italian data that's been released but not published. And they reported that they had five patients die. And this is a while ago, so it needs to be updated. And I'm told there will be a new publication in about a week. But you can see that there was one person taking rituximab who did pass away. And this was a 54-year-old female, you can see at the bottom of the chart. And she had had the disease for 20 years and had secondary progressive MS. And she did not have any medical comorbidities whatsoever, but she was relatively disabled at baseline. She had an EDS of seven, which means that she could not walk more than five meters. However, if you look at everyone on a B cell depleting agent, these are the individuals in that same cohort who were taking Ocrevus on top and Rituxan on the bottom. And there were a total of 18 of them and only one passed away. And this works out to 5.6% mortality. But at the same time, the mortality in Italy for COVID-19 in the general population was 12.3%. So people with MS on Ocrevus and Rituxan actually did slightly better. Now, of course, these are very small numbers. And I should also note that they were really only testing people who are severely ill. So both of these mortality statistics are a little bit inflated and there could be other biases, but it certainly doesn't seem that people with MS taking these drugs are doing worse. In France, maybe there's a slightly different story. Again, this data is completely unpublished, so take it with a grain of salt. You can see in light purple are the individuals with MS with COVID-19 who are taking Ocrevus. No one taking Rituxan was in this cohort. And you can see they list, they categorized people in four different categories. At the top, people who are hospitalized on mechanical ventilation, then people who are hospitalized but not requiring oxygen, then people who are ho not hospitalized but had some limitations of their daily activities, maybe they were shortness of breath or just generally ill, or not hospitalized and no limitations on activities. In other words, they had a mild illness. And you can see there was one patient taking Ocrevus on a mechanical ventilator. So essentially the sickest person in this cohort was on Ocrevus. And you can see there were a few people in light purple who were not hospitalized but had some limitation on activities. And you can see relative to some of the other medications, maybe people taking Ocrevus did do slightly worse, but of course, very, very few patients. So take it with a grain of salt. And so I think that Professor Giovanoni makes some good points, but a few critiques I could make is that, you know, one of the things that he mentioned is that this is just uh, relies on case reports and anecdotal reports on the internet. And there may be a bias. People may not want to publish an article about their patient who passed away from COVID-19. They may not be super proud or interested in producing that article or posting it on social media. Another thing is that B cells, even though they may not be as critical as CD8 positive T cells, they're very important in defense against the virus. When we do the antibody test against COVID-19 to see if people who have been infected in the past, we're testing antibodies, anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. So obviously they're important. And even if they're not that important in the short run in clearing the virus, they may be effective in long-term immunity. And of course, this virus is gonna be around for a long time, and there may actually be a second wave in fall and winter in the Northern Hemisphere. Another thing that he talks about in the article that potentially you could get the treatment and be very conservative and stay at home. But the problem is that COVID-19 is gonna be around for a while. 
And despite what your lifestyle may be, it's really, really difficult to reduce your exposure to zero. Even if you're not working and you stay at home, you still have to get food and you have to have it delivered to your house and you know it could potentially be contaminated with viral particles. There's really no way to reduce your risk of exposure to zero over an extended period of time. And again, this may be going on until spring or summer 2021. So that may not be a pragmatic a strategy. Another thing is that there's some evidence that in people who are taking these drugs, Ocrevus and Rituxan, even if they skip their infusion, even if they delay their treatment, if they've been stable on the medication, the risk of relapse and new MRI lesions is relatively low. This is based on some preliminary data that I know about in the Combat MS study for rituximab, and someone actually had a publication on Ocrevus showing a similar finding. And the idea is, one, the B cells don't necessarily come back immediately after six months. Many people have depleted B cells for a long time, and also the B cells that come back may not have the same tendency towards autoimmunity. And so this drug, even though it's not usually prescribed as an induction therapy, may have some induction effect. And of course, different people are in a different situation. Some people are very stable. They've been on the medication for a long time. Some people may be in the middle of fulminant, newly diagnosed multiple sclerosis and treatment may be much more urgent. And I don't really think it makes sense to make the same decision for everyone. Also, some people may be at relatively low risk. They're younger, they're healthier, they don't have medical comorbidities, they don't have a high risk profession. But some people may be higher risk for, of COVID-19, just fundamentally unrelated to MS, unrelated to the drug. They may be older, they may have medical comorbidities such as heart failure, COPD. They may have a, a profession such that they're much more likely to be exposed to COVID-19. Uh, so I think he makes some good points, but I think that I have my critiques as well. What are your thoughts? Do you think that it's safe to receive these medications in the middle of the pandemic? What questions do you have? Of course, for your own uh, medical decisions, I would suggest that you talk to your own provider, but I'd love to engage with you here.